Hello friends, and welcome back to another video. This particular video exists because I remembered something a little bit interesting about being on Tumblr in the early days. Every once in a while, I'm just like, I have made so many videos about Tumblr, and yet I still miss things. So I remembered recently about how people used to be kind of thirsty, kind of fangirly about Tumblr's CEO at the time, David Karp. For context, this was the CEO of Tumblr. He was only 21 years old when he created it in 2007, so he felt very accessible, very much like a peer to a lot of the users on Tumblr, especially since he had a blog and interacted with them somewhat normally. Not to mention the fact that he is kind of the type. Hilariously ironic, I know, that the guy who created Tumblr is kind of the Tumblr type. I do not want to use the phrase Tumblr sexy man, firstly because applying that to a real person just feels incorrect, but you can see how he is adjacent to, to that. Tall, slender, dark hair guy, perceived as very interesting and intelligent with that, like, child tech genius backstory. You cannot deny that he, David Karp, has, has some qualities that are in, in the Venn diagram overlap with, with other iconic Tumblr men. So in this video, I'm gonna delve into just David Karp, his early relationship with the fan base. Was, it was weird and it was interesting, yes, but even more than that, I'm gonna go into just the story of him creating Tumblr, his role throughout the years and the many turmoils of Tumblr. Tumblr is something that really often feels like it belongs to us collectively, like it was built by us, the user base, and its identity is so inextricable from the communities that we've created on it. And yet, some guy created Tumblr. It's not this huge, eternal entity that it sometimes feels like. Some guy just made it. Some guy just made Tumblr one day. And I feel like I, that it's easy to forget that. At least I definitely forget that a lot. So I thought that this would be an interesting topic for me to research and of course to share with you. But before we go any deeper down this internet rabbit hole, I have got to tell you a little bit about this video's sponsor, Audible. I personally listen to a lot of audiobooks. I love audiobooks because I find that they just are so helpful for fitting more books into my life. It can be really hard to find the time to read. You can listen to them while you're commuting somewhere, while you're doing your boring chores. And Audible offers an incredible selection of content across every genre. Whatever it is that you're into, they're gonna have something for you. For me, it's a lot of queer science fiction and fantasy books. One of the best ones that I've read lately that I cannot recommend highly enough is She Who Became the Sun by Shelley Parker Chan. It is so excellent and I love it so much. And it took me an embarrassingly long amount of time to realize that the title was a pun. When you become an Audible member, you can select any audiobook you would like to get for free. And after that, you'll even continue to get another free audiobook every single month. And those books will be yours to keep forever, even if you end up canceling your membership down the line. Plus, all Audible members now have access to a huge selection of titles, all included within the membership. And that includes all kinds of audiobooks, podcasts, Audible originals, guided fitness and meditation programs, sleep tracks, and all kinds of new stuff is being added all the time. New members can try out Audible for 30 days for free. So head on over to audible.com slash strangeons or text strangeons to 500-500 to check out that. Enjoy your regularly scheduled Tumblr content, you little goblins. So the most well-known heritage post, I guess you would say, concerning David Karp is probably this one. Thank you, with a bunch of pictures of David Karp. This one is a little bit murdery, I will not lie. It says rule number one, if Tumblr's creator comes up on your dash, you must reblog. Yes. How does this not have however many notes? Because some people aren't following the rules. Goddamn rule breakers. I mean, how could you be so disrespectful to the guy who gave us everything? He looks like a sim, he's so pretty. Tumblr has the sexiest daddy ever. This is true, true story. Jesus Christ, I didn't think these people actually existed. I assumed they were an urban legend, which is to say the David Karp fangirls. Send help. Okay, e-boobs, sure. <laughs> The people who call David Carp daddy give me cancer. That man is Jesus. Good God, he's perfect. Wow, he's hot and he created the best site on earth. Just so many feelings. Date of origin, 2011. And if you're still not quite getting the idea, I think I'm going to show you a few more heritage posts. Great images of the creator. All posted by him, I will, I will remind you. This one was actually posted in 2006, which is before Tumblr was launched to the public, back when it was just him talking to himself on here. Our very own Tumblr CEO, at David, is Metal Gear Solid's big boss this Halloween. Yep, our big boss is better than your big boss. Go to hell, David. Metal Gear is ruined. I threw up in my mouth. Fuck off, Carp, you fucking... <laughs> I don't know what y'all nerds are talking about, but I'd let him piss in my asshole. 
The creator of Tumblr is hotter than any other guys. Look at the rest of them internet site creators. Tom from MySpace, the Zuck, the Google boys, the, the YouTube guys. But calm down, Tumblr, daddy's home. I made Tumblr, bitches love Tumblr. I, re I remember the, the I made Tumblr, bitches love Tumblr picture. It was fucking everywhere. Tumblr is my escape. Without it, my life would be very boring. Reblog if you support David Karp and all the awesomeness he made in your life. Haha, <laughs> well, this is kind of funny. David Karp, you did indeed create something quite amazing. Someone photoshopped this weird fake quote attributed to him to start drama on Tumblr where he's like, ah, I hate SJWs or whatever. But I love this image because it's like, kind it's kind of Tumblr sexy man vibes a little bit, just the little bow tie. Facebook got Mark, MySpace got Tom. Be proud Tumblr people, we have a hot daddy. When the maker of Tumblr is on your dashboard, always reblog. Finger guns guy. So to recap, David Karp content on early Tumblr was very much characterized by one comparison to other tech CEOs, him being like the hot one apparently, people calling him daddy, the father of Tumblr, the always reblog, the creator, always reblog David Karp meme. That was, I remember that going around a lot. And then of course on all of these posts, there's always just as many anti-David Karp fangirls as there are David Karp fangirls. Like there was quite a few people who hated him for the meme because of the people calling him hot and calling him daddy. If you look at the David Karp tag on Tumblr now, there's not really too much being said. There's a lot of people reminiscing about the golden ages of people calling him daddy in 2011. There's people joking about what if what if he comes back to be Tumblr CEO again? Apparently there was a post by one of those like, post from a darker timeline or post from a brighter timeline, one of those blogs. One of those blogs posted that he was coming back to Tumblr or something and created a minor hoax around it, but no, it is not true. So there's quite a lot of people in this tag joking about him buying Tumblr back or he's, he's gonna be the one who saves us. David Karp is going to restore Tumblr back to his former glory. And all I wanna know is, are you gonna give us back our porn? He created Tumblr and then this man walked away with hundreds of millions of dollars. I don't know how the full billion was shared up. Tumblr was bought for a billion dollars by Yahoo at one point, but I don't think all of it went into David Karp's pocket, no. But anyway, he has hundreds of millions of dollars and is getting back Tumblr for five euros. <laughs> yes, David Karp is buying Tumblr back from whatever company owns it now for five euros. Most of you won't remember, but we used to have a golden rule in Tumblr, always reblog the creator. There he is in all of his... Oh, he's kind of cosplaying Thursday, actually. Huh. Who actually is David Karp? Why? What is, what is all this about? Well, I'm gonna get into a little bit of backstory for you. He grew up in Manhattan and began teaching himself HTML at the age of 11. He dropped out of high school at the age of 15, technically was homeschooled to make that legal in New York, but he was spending most of his time pursuing various internships and work opportunities within the tech industry as a teenager. At 17, he apparently went on like a self-discovery journey to Japan to like immerse himself in the technology and culture. Yes, it sounds like he has extremely cool parents to let him do all of this stuff. The first company that he ended up starting was a software consultancy company. However, this man, David Karp, had layers, like an onion. He had hobbies and interests that he wanted to share online, but he was having trouble finding the right tools to do that. He found a lot of social media sites that existed at the time, like Facebook or Twitter, to be kind of shallow and stifling to creativity, but he found blogging platforms like WordPress to be very geared towards kind of polished long form content, not to mention you were limited to the medium of text. He had the skills to do so, so he kind of just created the platform that he wanted. He enlisted the help of a programmer named Marco Armet, who worked for his consultancy company, and together they created the very first version of Tumblr. Tumblr was officially launched to the public in February of 2007, although, as I mentioned, there are some very important posts on David's Tumblr from before February 2007, back when the site was just him talking to himself and testing things out. After Tumblr was launched, it immediately started gaining thousands of users, overnight success. And that was great news for David because the plan was that Tumblr was gonna be like this shiny example of what he could do that would help bring hype to his consultancy company. But of course we know how that turned out. Uh, it was not long before Tumblr was his full-time job. In 2009, Carp was named best young tech entrepreneur by Business Week. In 2010, he was named one of the top 35 innovators in the world under the age of 30 by the MIT Technology Review and was featured on a lot of kind of similar lists and spotlights of, of hot young entrepreneurs. At the time, social media was very up and coming and people really were really like captivated by this mythology of the young tech entrepreneur. There's a lot of weird articles that like refer to David Karp as like, boy genius, David Karp, when like, 
sounds like he just he was just interested in things like he just liked stuff as a teenager and his was in a really unique situation with amazing parents that let him pursue that. He's kind of just a guy who likes things and got lucky. But I digress. There's all these interviews from around like 2010-ish with David Karp about like his work ethic and his lifestyle and like what's his secret? Is he just a boy genius or what? From reading a lot of those articles it sounds like as a 21 year old CEO he was a little bit chaotic. Or as he says, I'm very anti-schedule. Just vibing, just calling people whenever he needs them instead of making meetings. It sounds like the company culture of early Tumblr was very fun, but just, it, it also sounds like he must have been a little bit hellish to have as a boss. <laughs> If you do like organization. But he's just kind of different, you know? He drives a gas-efficient Vespa instead of a car. He has couches instead of conference tables in the Tumblr office. How quirky. It's all very, like, fetishizing the mythology of the, the hot young tech entrepreneur. However, it is still a bit refreshing to read, not, like, nonetheless, now, ten years later. Because in a lot of these interviews, he's just like, yeah, so, uh, my parents were great. I like to get a lot of sleep and not work on weekends and spend time on my hobbies. It's very much the opposite of like hustle culture and I don't know, it's just refreshing. The impression I get from those interviews from 10 years ago is that he's just kind of a nerdy guy who fixates on topics that he finds interesting and this is the path that it led him down and, and he's very grateful to be in that position and very appreciative of the people around him at Tumblr who help him with it. Not to mention he loves the product that they've made. In 2011 he said, I'm on Tumblr all day. I don't follow a ton of people, but I post and reblog stuff I really care about. I love my blog. I get most of my news from my Tumblr dashboard. And if you scroll back and look through his blog, yeah, he's kind of just a guy. Like he posts a lot of photography, he posts quotes that he likes, he's... He's a Tumblr hipster, that's what he is. And then every once in a while you are just jarred back to reality by a post like this where you're like, oh wait, actually this guy is like an important influential guy in the tech industry. Back back when Tumblr was still like, whatever, mainstream and selling for a billion dollars, which it is not, no longer. So that's kind of the backstory. But now onto the part that I find extremely interesting. As CEO of Tumblr, David Karp repeatedly declined opportunities to move the company to the hyper-competitive environment of Silicon Valley. He wanted the culture of the company to remain this kind of small startup in New York. Rather than chasing this meteoric growth and maximization of profits against all odds, he resist he went the complete opposite extreme. He resisted growing the company at almost every turn. In 2010, Tumblr was down for 24 hours because it had this huge spike in, in users joining an activity that it just could not handle. And they just had to spend 24 hours scrambling to like get more servers or whatever tech people do. I don't know. I read an article on it. But Carp loved the creative and social justice driven user base of Tumblr and he fully intended to prioritize those things and that energy when working on the site. In a 2012 interview he said that he found nothing really interesting about a lot of other social media platforms. And about YouTube he said, the only real tools for expression these days are YouTube. So that's good. Which turns my stomach, he says. <laughs> They take your creative works, your films that you put hours of energy into, they put ads on top of it. They make it as gross an experience to watch your film as possible. I'm sure it will contribute to Google's bottom line, but I'm not sure it will inspire any creators. He said that in 2012 and I'm just like, oh my god. Oh my god, the before times. Oh my god. I see, yeah, I see why this man left the, left the tech industry. So essentially what I'm trying to tell you here is that it's not at all a coincidence that Tumblr is like kind of this janky little dumpster site that inspires us nonetheless. That it's kind of one of the only places that feels comfy in the social media hellscape. That's exactly what it's supposed to be. I think because Tumblr feels so defined by, by the communities that are on it and, and user creativity, it kind of feels like this weird accident sometimes that we're all kind of creating a little bit, but that's not the case. Like Tumblr is what it is and is able to, to do those things and foster those communities because that's exactly what David Carb wanted it to be. Tumblr is the way that it is because the CEO said, fuck growth and profit for the sake of it. I'm gonna make a platform that respects its users and fosters creativity. I am flabbergasted by this knowledge because people loving David Carp has always been such a meme to me that I'm like, what? Like, I never suspected there was actually good reasons to like David Carp. Everyone unironically say thank you daddy right now. You know where this is going. I've, I've already spoiled it. In, in 2017, David Carp announced that he would be leaving Tumblr after 10 years of running it, and he did in fact leave one year later in 2018. At that point, Tumblr had been on the downhill for a while. It's obviously not as profitable as sites like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. That, that isn't what 
the industry values these days. And so Tumblr is widely considered to be a, a failure. But David Carp's leaving was the beginning of probably an even steeper downhill for it. Tumblr has been sold twice for lower amounts each time. The Not Safe for Work ban happened and like half the user base left. I read this really good article called The Inside Story of How Tumblr Lost Its Way by Elizabeth DeLuna. It was written February, 2022, so quite recently. Um, and it, I'll link it below. It goes into a lot more detail about what's been going on internally at Tumblr for the past couple of years, but I'll give you the TLDR. Things are bad. Tumblr being acquired twice has resulted in high staff turnover and the people at the very top of the company, the people with final say over the decisions, not really quite understanding what Tumblr is about and then suppressing good ideas that come from people who do get it more. Tumblr is never gonna compete with Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, etc. It's, it's something else entirely. You have to embrace and improve what it is already good at rather than adding stupid features that nobody wants or like fixing things that are just, you know? Embrace what people love about Tumblr and also bring back some of the old features that people really miss. And there are people working at Tumblr who do get that. But plans for its future have been at a standstill for quite a while because of those disconnects within the company. And that's not shocking at all. Like as users, we very much feel that standstill and that absence of direction. Like it does feel like we've just been left to run Feral since 2018. So David Karp is gone from Tumblr and things are bad at Tumblr. But, but what is David Karp up to instead if, if not running Tumblr? Honestly, it's quite hard to find out anything about his life these days because he doesn't really use social media and it's not like anybody's interviewing him about being a hot young tech entrepreneur now that he's a whole crusty 36. But from what I can find, he's focusing a lot on social and political advocacy work. While still at Tumblr, he joined the Planned Parenthood board of directors in 2014 and ran some initiatives for the tech industry to support Planned Parenthood. In 2018, he joined the board of directors of a political advocacy group called Future Now. I don't know if he's still doing that because again, it's hard to find out what he's doing now, but that's what he was doing in 2018. And in 2019, he donated a whole $1 million to Planned Parenthood. So that's Pretty amazing. You can find records of like some other pretty significant donations that he's made online as well, but he's very, very not online. He pops up every once in a while, but usually to comment on some like huge massive world event that, that every public figure feels the need to comment on, which at first struck me as being kind of odd or shallow. Like you don't post for two years and then you just jump in there, join in with a little hashtag Black Lives Matter out of nowhere. Why, why do you feel the need to do that? But now knowing how much activism he has supported quietly with both huge monetary donations and with his skills and technology, I really do think that he feels some kind of a moral obligation, I guess, to, to comment on these things, to, to not stay silent on social media, even though he clearly hates social media. He seems like a pretty okay guy doing doing what he can to improve the world. Moral of the story, kids, is go make a Tumblr blog. It's fun. Also buy their merch so that they can afford to show us titties again. And remember to always reblog daddy. And with that, I will see you in another video very soon, my friends. <laughs>